Okay, so yes, as said, I'm not actually an archaeologist. Uh, I was approached by Duncan Sayer, of course he is, um, and he asked me a very simple question, which is, how are swords and burials depicted in the literature? What kind of evidence for it uh, survives, and, and what does it suggest? So far, it's not really clear, actually, how this evidence relates to the archaeological evidence, but it seems to me that there must be a relationship. I know that Neil Price has been um, a little bit sceptical about that, but I think that there must be a relationship and that it's worth exploring what that is. And if the evidence doesn't coincide, then it strikes me that that's an interesting thing to explore as well. Um, literature, of course, is rather difficult to use as evidence, um, but if it's well analysed, it can actually be quite reliable. Unlike uh, annals or chronicles, exactly what uh, has just been said, which are always written by someone who is specifically trying to convince you of something. They sat down to write this account to convince you. Um, somebody who is writing a poem, or composing a poem, I should say, is only really trying to entertain their audience. And it's only an effective poem if it makes sense in terms of the audience's cultural assumptions. Um, so, there are surprisingly few depictions of swords in burials in Anglo-Saxon literature. There are lots of swords in battles, of course. The most detailed source is Beowulf, which is now being reasonably reliably dated to the late 7th century, linguistically. Um, and I should say, too, that although Beowulf is set in the past, there is reason to believe that the poem is depicting more or less contemporary Anglo-Saxon England. Um, if you have questions about that, ask me later. Beowulf includes the descriptions of three funerals, all of warriors, Shield, Hildeberg's kin, and Beowulf himself, each of which famously display different funerary practices. Interestingly, there is nothing to suggest in the text that the, sorry, that the poet thinks that this is unusual or that he expects his audience to be surprised by it. Typically, if an author does think his audience will be surprised, he will actually make an explaining comment like um, we find in Andreas, poem Andreas, where the poet comments on the cannibalism of the Myrmidonians, so was Theo Helcher, that was their custom. Um, and if it's an archaic custom, we see the same thing. Bede, for example, when he reports on the English gathering to listen to um, travelling clerics in the past, says, was in that tier theo ongelkunis volkum. That was the custom in England at that time. So Beowulf suggests at least some diversity, and interestingly, it even offers a clue as to why this might be. In both the cases where the warriors live to be an old age, as opposed to dying unexpectedly, as Hildeberg's kin do, the poet actually, uh, sorry, the warrior actually gives specific directions for how he wishes his funeral to be. So these are the two funerals of Beowulf and of Shield. Um, Shield is placed in a boat, so he himself a fed in word and welder, as he himself asked when he ruled with words. And Beowulf gives directions to his nephew, Wilaf, when he's dying, which Wilaf then reports back to Beowulf's men. Um, he says that okay, he says that um, Beowulf asks that they build a mound in memory of his deeds which his warriors then do, so he benesef, as he asked. Usually, literary scholars uh, interpret the difference in forms as reflecting the difference between pagan and Christian burial practice, but intriguingly, neither Shield nor Beowulf make any reference at all to religious beliefs when they're requesting these, these funerals. Beowulf talks at length about God, and he talks about wanting to go to be with his ancestors, but at no point does he say, please do this so it will allow me to have to, to go to heaven or to go to Valhalla, to make that journey. He only talks about it in terms of what its significance will be in contemporary society, that other people will see it. Okay. Obviously, I don't want to minimise the role of religion, but... There is nothing in the poem that suggests that the preference for these forms is anything other than a personal preference, for whatever that's worth. Okay, let's have a look at funerals themselves. First one is of Shield. Shield is the founder of the Shieldings, 
and he is defined by his warrior prowess. So we can assume that this is regarded as an appropriate burial for a warrior. He's laid at the centre of the ship by the mast, famously the same placement as the body in Mound 1 at Sutton Hoo, and grave goods are placed around him. Uh, and the poet says, there were many treasures from far away, ornaments brought. I've not heard of a more beautiful ship adorned with battle weapons, war gear, swords and armour. So, while S.H.I.E.L.D. presumably has a personal sword, or a sword that has particular significance to him, it's interesting that it doesn't seem to be here among this list. Instead, he's interred with several swords, uh, none of which have any distinguished lineage. Um, throughout Beowulf, you get long lineages of swords, and as you see, these don't have that at all. Um, and they don't seem to hold any particular place among <coughs> them, any of the other war gear, perhaps suggesting that this is more an expression of wealth than a reflection of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s warrior status. Instead, actually, emphasis is given to the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. is buried with jewellery from far off places, which the poet seems to regard as a more important sign of his um, power and, and his significance while he was alive. Okay. So the next one is Hildeberg's kin. This is the funeral of Hildeberg's male relatives. Here there is a feud that re-erupts between her father and her husband and in the ensuing battle her son and her brother are killed. Their funeral, which she orders and designs, is an expression of her grief but also it seems to me of her anger at the conflict um, and the poem stresses that she has been treated very badly in this situation. So even though neither warrior expresses a wish for this particular form of funeral, here too it seems to be a ritual which is individual and adapted to specific circumstances. Hildeberg orders a pyre to be built for her brother, Naif, and then places her son beside him so that they're cremated together. Again, whatever the religious elements uh, may be at play here, they're actually not stressed. Instead, the poet focuses on how the pyre allows for the public display of Hildeberg's distress. It's an extraordinary and, and very moving, very violent description, actually. It says that you could see the bodies being burned and you could see the wounds being ripped open as the fire started to um, uh, consume them. You'll also notice that she makes a point of burying uh, the warriors in the clothes they were wearing, so you can see the signs of the battle on them. She doesn't put them in beautiful clothes as, as you find in Ibn Fadlan, for example. Heads melted open, words, wounds burst open, blood gushed out, and the bodies hate bites. Fire swallowed everything, the greediest guests, those who were taken in battle from both sides. So this too is obviously a warrior funeral, um, and here there's actually no interest in, certainly no interest in mentioning swords, but no interest actually in mentioning any kind of grave goods. So finally we have Beowulf's funeral. This, the description of the funeral takes up most of the last section of the poem, and it actually takes up a lot more space than any of Beowulf's actual battles. So that perhaps gives you some sense of how important the poet thought it was. Um, as Beowulf is dying, he gives Wilaf uh, instructions for his funeral, which Wilaf takes back to the war band. And these instructions are the very first thing that he tells them, not anything about the nature of Beowulf's last battle or his death or anything. He tells them how Beowulf wants to be buried. Beowulf is actually given two sets of grave goods, neither of which include uh, swords of any description. Um, the first set is cremated with him. Um, his pyre is decorated with helmets and shields, bright baronies, as he had requested. And then the remains are buried, buried in a barrow. Um, they laid rings and brooches in the barrow and all such ornaments. So consequently in this burial the, the jewellery would be the most visible aspect, at least as it's imagined here. <coughs> Aside from the evidence of funerals, there's also the broader issue of the cultural significance assigned to swords in Beowulf. Here war gear and especially swords tend to be passed <coughs> on. Swords are consistently referred to as heirlooms and celebrated for their age. Um, they're referred to as Elilaf, Gomlerilaf, Elsward, Gomlerisward, Erilaf. So, laf um, is actually a word that just means heirloom, but in poetry you can use it to mean sword. If you say laf, it is quite clear that you mean a sword. So, again, the emphasis is on passing it on. 
Um, and in fact, when Beowulf is dying, the thing that he says is, I wish I had a son to leave my war gear to. Um, his people are about to be wiped out, so there are other things that maybe would be more important for his son to take on at this point, but the thing that he focuses on is the war gear, actually. Um, and similarly, when the poet introduces We Laugh, um, the first thing he says is that he took his ancient sword, known among men as Eamon, son of Eorleth's heirloom. Um, and then we actually get a little history of um, this weapon, um, where it says that um, Willa's father, Wilson, held this treasure for many years, the sword and the burnie, until his son became a warrior like his old father, and then among the Yeats he gave him war gear, many of much kind, and then left this life. So there's almost a sense that he only really feels comfortable to die when he has had a chance to pass this on. So once again, the emphasis is on passing on important weapons, not burying them. Here it seems that, uh, as I say, Weirston is really only content to die once he's done this. Um, and indeed, at another point in the poem, there's actually a passage where a character buries a ranger of war gear um, precisely because he says he no longer has anyone who can carry these things, so he has no choice but to bury them. But he speaks as though this is absolutely a kind of a last resort. Unfortunately, beyond Beowulf, there's not much evidence for burials um, in the Old English poetic corpus, um, but what does exist corroborates what's found in Beowulf. Um, in more than the Wanderer and even the Battle of Brunnenbra, um, references to death or mourning um, are, are limited. The ruin describes the dead as being in Orthgrasp, the Earth's grasp, which perhaps suggests some information. Um, but the emphasis on old swords we see even right up until 10th century poems like Malvern, where um, when Brithnoth is describing the different kinds of weapons and he's describing their excellence, the thing he focuses on in relation to swords is their age, but not in relation to any other kind of weapon. Hadley has suggested that part of what makes grave goods valuable is their history, the notion that they carry with them memories of great deeds that have been performed by the people who possess them, which seems like a very reasonable theory given this. Um, but interestingly, when you do see weapons buried with the dead in the poetry, there actually isn't such interest in describing their, their histories. That's really only something you find with swords that are actually being used at the time, which is interesting. Um, I know Sue Brinning has argued that um, there's perhaps a deliberate attempt to make swords that are buried seem older than perhaps they really were, and that there is a deliberate attempt to construct age which, uh, again, we also see in some of the wills. So, to conclude, what the literary evidence reveals is that funerals were personal, and the particular details of each, especially in relation to grave goods, seem to have affected the wishes of the person or their family, an idea that perhaps makes some sense of the very wide variety of practices that we find in the industry.